Good morning, everyone. It's good to be together and to uh, take time to think of the life, death, burial, and resurrection of Jesus to continue in our sermon series. And this week, we're going to split it up over a couple parts. So that's probably not two 30-minute sections, right? <laughs> two 28 minutes. We'll do it for there. Jesus fills our thirst for balance. I don't know how they do these rock pictures like that. And I looked at a number of them, the way that people can balance things. Doesn't that amaze you? Are you a person that's really good at balance? <laughs> I said to Dave, he and I should do a slack line, but we didn't. We thought that wasn't very good. We'll do something else instead. Jesus fills our thirst for balance. Something else that people in around us and within the church and you know, different areas of our lives that we're looking for is a balanced life, that we're not overdoing some areas rather than others and missing out on things. So as we think about balance, list the components of your life that take your time, your energy, your finances, or your attention. You think of some of those things? Different things that you kind of have to pour yourself into. And you can start to think of that as we move this way. <clears throat> this week's object lesson part I had to go with the bigger space because we have bigger items and some construction. <clears throat> so we think of balance as one versus another. So Let's say this one is pleasure. But what do you balance pleasure with? What's the other side? What do you think? It can be work, responsibility, unpleasurable things. How do you decide where your resources go? Well, if we put a little resources into this side, well, it's a little too much pleasure. So now I have to add a little more unpleasure and back to some pleasure because I don't feel that that's very fair. And wait a second. Is that kind of how a lot of your life goes? You focus on one thing or the other? Like, wow, you know, I've been sure been working a lot, so what's the other side? I've had no time to play. So I'm going to take all this now, I'm going to go out and play, and I don't want to think about work or any other responsibilities. But, which worked better last night, about 11 o'clock and your eyes are blurry, this works really well. <laughs> if you're steady with it, Sometimes you're going to need a bigger cup. It's such a challenge, isn't it? But you've got to decide, well, which side am I going to put it into? What cup am I filling right now? What's the part of my life that I feel is lacking? It's an either or this or that approach to life. And you think in your life, well, you know what? There's, it's been a long time since I've had this. And I've sure spent a lot of time doing that. And our energy, our time, our finances, our attention starts shifting from cup to cup, back and forth. And if we get tired of these two cups, well, this is work and pleasure, so what are a couple other cups you can put on here? Sure, have been focusing a lot on health lately, you know? And there's, well, what's the counter to that? Pleasure is always, you can add that one in. You can keep that one the same and keep balancing it back and forth. Or work. Work takes a long part of your day, your time, and your attention. But it's that either or seesaw approach to life. And you can see why most people would look at their life and say, you know, I have a hard time being balanced. I just find that I can't quite achieve that. And even if you did, what would happen? You gotta cheat it a bit. How long does it stay balanced? Not very long and not very well. 
So the problem is, and this is what I think the problem is for us that are trying to achieve balance in this way, is that there are multiple choices. So which cups am I filling? Where is this energy going? What do I focus on right now? Is it time for this or is it time for that? But you have limited resources. You know what? Good thing we only have two cups. Because when you're pouring out of yourself, doesn't this get lower and lower and lower? You can change cups, but it just gets lower and lower and lower. And eventually you think, man, I'm sure feeling empty. I'm feeling dry. I'm feeling burnt out. I'm feeling stressed. Because I don't have much in reserve. I'm really getting tired. We can live like that. And a lot of people around us live like that. And we can get in seasons of living like that as well. So there's some usual solutions, I think, to people that are trying to achieve this balance and to work it this way. One is that they limit choices. You know, I have too many responsibilities. So, what's the thing that I'm going to do? You know what one of these cups is? Going to church. If I just take that cup out, limit resources. I don't have to pour anything into that. I can have faith, I'll call it faith, but I won't call it church. I can have faith because it doesn't cost me as much, but I don't want to go to church. So we just limit the resource. We just take that cup off the table and say, you know what, I'm tired of pouring myself into volunteering, into church. I'm tired of pouring myself into this relationship versus that relationship. And so I'll just limit it. The other thing is to add resources. What fills my tank? How can I continue to give more? You know what, it's been a long time since I've been golfing or to the spa or what are the things that help fill you so that you can add more? Dave, it, that cup is an emptying one. Taking Dave golfing is emptying resources. <laughs> Ephesians 4, yeah, not filling self. Yeah. Or combine choices. You say, well, if I have to go to work, I'm going to make sure it's work and retirement and, you know, I'm just going to pour myself into that sucker and it's going to fill up and I'm just going to, it's going to be a big, it's going to be a super big gulp. I'm just going to pour everything into that and combine it and say that cup is now going to have to fill everything. Now, because I can, I don't know how many of you know that I can juggle, but I didn't bring my stuff, so, but I can't. But that was one of my... I can at least do three, but what's the problem with juggling them? Because then that's what you'd be doing is, oh, this cup, that cup, this cup, that cup, just switching them around, and that's how people try to balance their life, and just, just one after another. Oh, those two are pretty similar, I'll put those on the scale, and compare them against each other. But it doesn't stay. It's not a great way to do it. Are we the only ones that have ever come off balance? Well, are there some scriptural examples of people that got off balance? Balance is difficult. It's hard to come to a balance, isn't it? It's hard to achieve that. You can cheat the system a bit, but it is hard. And even if you get to it, it's hard to maintain. Because there's always something. There's always somebody else or some other part of the equation or, or something that's happening. The first three kings... You see the first three kings in there? All three of them, their lives became unbalanced. They had a great option. God said, I will lead the nation through you. You surrender to me. I will fill you. You fill them. What happened with Saul? Where did he become unbalanced? Saul focused on power instead of faithfulness. Saul got worried that he was going to lose the kingdom. Saul got worried David was going to take over. So Saul said, let me take that part out of the equation and I'll just worry about keeping my kingdom. So what did God do? Your kingdom will be removed from you. Well, you think, well, David, David was God's anointed. God put him into position. David, he would have had balance, didn't he? Well, he does. But David gets off balance too. 
David is a great leader for the nation. One of the best kings, you know, ideal there. But do you realize how much he neglected his family? When you read through, you see that all of his sons hated him. And at the end of his life, is pretty miserable because he says, well, I've done all of this. You know, had a little slip up with Bathsheba in there too. But none of the sons trust me. What kind, of a, what kind of a dad, what kind of a father have I been? And then Solomon, <coughs> smartest guy, greatest wisdom, but where does he fail? How many wives did Solomon have? Yeah, more than one. <laughs> Tried to please too many people. So he was neither a great political leader, and he wasn't good for his family. But he just tried to please too many people. And he becomes unbalanced in that. And when he writes Ecclesiastes, he ends that with, you know, I've got to take all of this and give it to somebody else. And nobody's as smart as me. They're not going to do as well as this as I've done. And when you get to the end and you end up with nothing, that's not a great spot to be. And so he loses balance at that part of his life. What's your process for balance? What do you do? How do you decide, first of all, what cups you're dealing with? And then how do you decide, do you fill one and then the other? Do you fill a little of each? What's your process? How does Jesus and his teachings help you have and maintain balance? Following Jesus, how does that help you with this whole scenario that's different than an unbeliever? Somebody that doesn't have a relationship with Jesus. How is your life and the balance, although difficult, that you can attain, how is it different than those around us? Was that 30 minutes? Pretty close. Part two, coming up in just a little bit. You know, after some guidance and some perspective about the whole thing. How does Jesus make a difference in our lives? How does he fill our thirst for wanting to have balance? So as we pick up the second part for the sermon, the guidance and perspective that we need to have in order to have lives that not only have balance for us, but also show others that Jesus fills our thirst for balance. We try to listen to Jesus and get our direction and our guidance from him. What passages give you guidance when you're feeling off balance? It's not just a feeling or a sense. Do you have some of those passages that come to you that just, you know, do not be anxious? What kind of passages come to your mind that say, well, that's, that's what helps me recenter, get back to the middle so that I have that better foundation. John 3.16. There's passages, I think, that, that just come to us that help us when we're feeling off balance. The one that kept coming to my mind through the week is Matthew 6.25-34, which is a bit of a problem for me because in a few weeks we're doing worry. Well, if that's what this whole thing's about. But it's the end of it that I want us to focus on in particular. Because the passage, Matthew 6, 25 through 34. Now maybe this is one that does strike you, that is part of your repertoire. Maybe it's one that you add in that's just a good reminder. I know it was one of Adam's favorites. It says, therefore I tell you, do not worry about your life. When you're wondering which cup to fill, where do you put your energy? So what are the things that he says, well, don't focus on those things. Don't worry about your life, what you will eat or drink, about your body, what you will wear. Kind of the major things, the day-to-day -day things that just have to happen. Is not life more important than food and the body more important than clothes? Look at the birds of the air. They don't sow or reap or store away in barns, yet your heavenly Father feeds them. Are you not much more valuable than they who of you, by worrying, can add a single hour to his life? When we think about that balance and trying to achieve the balance, doesn't it often take more hours than what it gives? Just worrying and thinking, well, did I do enough? Am I putting the right energy here or there? Especially when we're off balance and we're trying to correct it, it's hard not to just overcorrect it. So the passage continues by saying, 
And why do you worry about clothes? See the lilies of the field? They grow. They don't labor or spin. Yet I tell you that not even Solomon in all his splendor was dressed like one of these. If that is how God clothes the grass of the field, which is here today and tomorrow, was thrown into the fire, will he not much more clothe you? O you of little faith. So do not worry saying, what shall we eat or what shall we drink or what shall we wear? So it gives us a couple examples from nature. God takes care of the birds and he takes care of the flowers. Now some people end there and they think that they're going to be a bird or a flower and do nothing. And God will just take care of them. Well, he didn't say people. He did, God takes care of birds and flowers. If you're one of those, you can go without any work at all. But... Don't worry about these things, thinking, I've got to accomplish this. I've got to get there. I've got to make all this happen. Then we get towards the end of it. For the pagans run after these things. They think, well, that's what they spend their life doing. is pouring into one cup and then the other and one cup and then the other and then the other. Or just saying, oh, I'm just going to pour it all into this one. Forget about balance. I'm just going to pour everything I have into this. The pagans run after these things, and your heavenly Father knows that you need them. Isn't that interesting? It's not want. He knows what you need. And this is the part of the passage that kept coming back to me as I was thinking about balance. But seek... What's that little blue word in there? Seek first His kingdom and His righteousness. And all of these things will be given to you as well. I think that word first there is really relevant. Seek first his kingdom. Think about what does Jesus want? What's the work of the kingdom? What's going to outlive me? What's going to outlast? What really is the purpose of my life? Faith is not one of the cups that you fill. It is everything. That's what gives meaning to everything else. Seek first his kingdom and his righteousness. Righteousness is that word that connects to being right with God, being in a right relationship. So seek that first, put that as the priority, and these things will be given to you as well. Therefore, do not worry about tomorrow, for tomorrow will worry about itself. One of my favorite passages, I just like the way this one reads, each day has enough trouble of its own. Don't borrow trouble. God will give you enough to deal with tomorrow when tomorrow comes. Now there are things in life that we need to be prepared for, that we need to look ahead. That's planning, that's preparedness. But worrying about it doesn't change it. If that is what prompts you to action and better planning, then, you know, there's the... We're going to have to talk about worry because it's one of the things that people thirst for. They're too worried. But what they want is peace while they're worrying. So the difference. Well, let's go back over here. I had to put that in there because I was thinking, when, when do I move and go to this? Back to the objects. So what do you think of this balance? You notice it stayed the whole time? I didn't know it was going to do that. The problem with the object lesson is it's completely flawed. So if you've been paying attention up until now, you can now just not pay attention. Is this the way life really works? How many times would you only have two choices? Life is a little more complicated than that. How many cups do you have? Is it two? You only have two choices of things to balance? So how are we going to do that? Life is a little more like this. You see that? How many points of balance do you have there? How many cups? I got to worry about, I got to think about health. What's the opposite? You know? You start thinking about how many things do you have to balance in a week? It just choices in a day. Children. Money. Work. Responsibility. Entertainment. 
yard work. Which weeds to kill? Does this kind of represent your life a little more? It's just when you think you got one. So how do you decide which cup to fill? I in no way said that I was going to get this to balance. Did you hear that? Isn't that kind of a better representation of what's going on in your life? It's just when you think, well, I've got it working with this friend or this relationship, then family's in trouble. Somebody's having a struggle here or there. You know, you, you get a spell where your health isn't good or your finances aren't well or, or, or. And away it goes and away it goes. And there's always something that's taking your time and attention. I don't have time to do all the important things. I just got to put out all the spot fires, all the little things that are irritating me. And you end up chasing these things down. We talked about the magnet. Take my yoke upon you. Because the magnet can get, the little compass can get messed up by a magnet. But when we follow Jesus, we say, okay, that's the direction that I want to go. That's where my focus is. Because the problem is I look down on that and I see all these cups and I see all these options. And even if I label one of them faith, or I label one church, it's just one cup among many. We pour ourselves out of ourself. We say, you know what? If I decide, if I pour it out of myself, that's one thing. So I'm going to cheat the system. Here's where we have the advantage. Who are you going to pour yourself into? It's not about me deciding what's going on with all of this. I'm going to say, you know what? I could pour my attention into all of these. I could decide which friends to invest in, which things to do, where to spend my money, what to do, what's, where's my health. Or I can say, Jesus, I'm giving it all to you. I don't want to make those choices. I don't want to look for that balance. I can't do this. If I try it, I'm just going to mess it up. So I'm just going to make that choice to do one big jug. And we usually get to about there. And then we say, okay, you can do a pretty good job, but I got a few of these that I like to do. Right? I know I should be all to Jesus, I surrender. Maybe a little more this week. Ooh. Give me a little bit of the back. I got something I need to worry about. You know who's pretty good at balance? Jesus. And so you wake up each day and you say, it's not my day, it's your day. It's not my finances, it's your finances. They're not my kids, they're your kids. You deal with them. <laughs> you ever felt like that? Well, <laughs> so what does Jesus do? He says, trust me. Trust me. It's okay. You take some time to rest. I'll pour myself into that. You take some time to play. It's good. I love to have fun with you. You know what? You got to get a little work done. You know what? You know that person that's been on your heart that you've wondered about? Give them a call. You see the difference in that? Who decides which cup gets filled? Just let Jesus do it. Let him decide and it comes out a proper balance every time. Because we don't do well with balance. But God does. We hunger and thirst for righteousness. The one cup that we've got to consider pouring ourselves into is our relationship with God. And the problem with people around us, and even people that go to church, is that it's only one cup. They only think about one thing. Or maybe it's a couple things. That's my volunteering and it's my... But we pour ourselves completely into Jesus and say, it's your life. You gave it to me. I gave it to you. You gave it back. I'm giving it back to you. You take it. You deal with it. You show me how to do this. You're the creator. I'm the created. What does this look like? And we get guidance from scripture and passages and all of that comes together. 
Some of our cups are happy and some of them are not. We need to change our perspective because I got another way that changes this up. Life isn't either or. Is it? The problem with this is it minimizes it to either or. That's not the reality of life. It's way more complicated than should I do this or that. It's a lot more like this. So it's multiple things that you've got to be thinking about and putting your mind to and connected to at all times. It's a constant filling from God and an outpouring. So Jesus can say, okay, you've poured it into me. Now, here's what I would like you to do. And he pours it back into you. You make the decision. I'll surrender to your choice. Okay. I've got some ideas. If you want to do it my way, I'm going to tell you how to do it. Love one another. Be kind to the poor. Do unto others as you would have them do unto you. I've got some good guidance for how you're going to do this. But you've got to choose what it looks like. And he pours back into us. And then we say, oh, okay, I understand that better. Third part of this. You know what else he changes? Not only do all the cups need to be on the platform. Because who knows how many you've got. It should, could have been a bigger sheet of plywood. Jesus says, I don't really play that balance too well. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to take that away. And I'm going to balance on that. So you put me at the center. Solid foundation, right around Matthew chapter 7. Build your house on the rock. Now, I can play that game all day. You take that center out and you replace it with that little nail. But when it's anchored on Jesus, and Jesus is the one that's saying, fill these cups, leave that one alone. You see this one here named selfishness? Let's just take that one out of the way. You can pour a little bit, a few drops in there, that's all you need. Don't fill that one. But you just listen, and Jesus tells us how to fill our life. But he changes our perspective to say you've got a different foundation than the world around you. The people around us are trying to balance on this. That's way more difficult. But with Jesus as that solid foundation, not only does he decide which cup, but he decides to give us that firm foundation. Now if you pour everything into these end cups, it'll fall off and the cups will fall off. You can overbalance it, but it at least gives you a much more stable foundation. So how does Jesus fill our thirst for balance? How does he do it? By changing the foundation and saying, I already have it. Come to me and I will give you that balance that you're looking for. So what do we do when we desire balance? How do we make this at all practical? One, acknowledge the natural desire to fill what you see is lacking. Does that make sense? When your life is getting out of balance, which, which one of these do you grab? Go for self and say, oh, I can fix this. Look, it's starting to tip. Oh, I can fix that. You know what? Alvin, doctor called and now he says I have cancer. Which, which one do I go for? You're going to probably grab both. Say, part of me wants to handle it, but I know I've got to let God handle it. But avoid that. I'm going to fix this. Go first to Jesus and get grounded with him. When life's getting out of balance, just wait a second. Before I make a decision here, what does God say? Where am I guided by scripture? What counsel do I need? What's the advice of others that are in the faith? Let me get that settled before I make any choices. And then spread that balance into other areas. Oh, I trusted him with this and it worked out really well. Maybe I should trust him in that. And it works out well. And it goes and it goes and it goes. Firmly establish your faith by building on the solid rock. So how do we build on that solid rock? What are the five things that we continue to talk about? Which are the five cups? And we could have put those as little pillars around the outside. Where do you pour yourself into? Fellowship, discipleship, ministry, evangelism, and worship. 
You choose how to do that as an individual in your life at this time, but we also choose to do that as a group. And by doing that as a group, that balance comes into the other parts of our life. But when we neglect that, and we say, I'm too busy to be showing my faith, I've got to deal with everything myself, and then I'll get right with God. Then I'll work on that relationship. It hardly ever comes. The last thing, share with others the source of your balance. Because we have something that the world is looking for. We have something that other people that, well, I believe in God. I have a faith cup. Well, it's different. Do you have that relationship? Do you have a pitcher full that you can share with others? So those are my thoughts about balance. Hopefully they've been a, a benefit to you a bit. I've got some hardware here that helps. Take home something. Jesus gives us balance because he changes the foundation and he shows us how to live a life that is balanced.